Thank you for coming to uh, the last session, I think, of this uh, room. And uh, happy to see all of you here. We're going to try to give you a motivating talk on what you can do to protect yourself from a threat that is coming up. And I think one of the things we need to do also is to kind of motivate the threat. So we have you know, 35 minutes. We'll do the best we can. And there's a little bit of a demo also at some point. So quick introduction. So this is my colleague, Paul Schreibert, uh, and I'm Max. We're both at IBM. We're part of the open quantum team, which I lead. And we do more than quantum safe. So we also work, actually, Paul did uh, a lot of work on quantum middleware, which is a product that IBM released. We have team members that work on Qiskit. And then, of course, we work on quantum safe. And I have various things that I do related to quantum safe, so I'll mention them as we go along. Um, I'm usually with a camera, so I'm an avid photographer. And I think, what did you say? You? I took it out. Um, but yeah, I was a history major at one point and used to play cards. OK, so don't play with him. He might beat you. Uh, you know, so takes us hold him, I think. Okay. There you go. OK, so the talk has really three parts to it. Uh, the first part is to try to explain quantum computing. It's not an easy task, so I'll do the best that I can. Um, it, it's complicated, but it works, and it's how nature works. So I'll leave it at that, and we'll get into it in a little bit more detail. Then we'll try to motivate the quantum threat, which is the important piece. Uh, and what we're doing about that as a community, as a world, scientists, and so on. And then we'll get into Kubernetes, not only the threat for Kubernetes, but specifically giving you an, a use case of where in the big Kubernetes stack that we need to sort of address things. So three parts. I'll do the first two parts, and then uh, Paul will do the last but it's also where he's going to do a demo and so on. So I'll give you as much time as possible. OK, so let's get into it. So f what is uh, quantum computing? So instead of s answering that question this way, maybe a better thing to answer is to say that there are different models of computing, right? There is digital computing that we know today. There's even biological computing, where you use biology to make some computation. And then there's, of course, quantum computing, and there could be more. And why do we need so many models? Well, the digital computer worked extremely well. It's all based on uh, a model of computing that is essentially a chewing machine. If you go into the theory of it, and without boring you, and probably most of you know, uh, what ends up happening is that there are problems that digital computers are fantastic at. And we all carry, uh, you know, I guess uh, Apple, uh, Steve Jobs was famous to say that we all have a supercomputer in our pocket. Um, and it's very, very powerful. But there are problems that computers uh, just cannot solve. Um, you know, and I guess in some ways you could say, uh, and more theoretical ways to say it is that there are problems where you can find efficient algorithm uh, to solve, and then there are problems where there is no known efficient algorithm. So the, these are like sort of the so-called NP hard problems. And there's lots of theory behind this, and we won't get into it. But the interesting thing is quantum computing, because it's such a different type of computing, the problems that are uh, NP hard, for instance, some of them you can actually solve super efficiently with a quantum computer. And there are various examples of this, and we'll get into at least one specific one. So that's maybe the important thing, is that a different style of computing means that you have now, all of a sudden, uh, the ability to solve some problems much faster. Okay? And when we're talking faster, we're not talking 2x, we're talking orders of magnitude faster. So that's the important thing. So why is that? Why, why are compu you know, quantum computers uh, have the ability to solve some problems so much better uh, than uh, other problems? 
but it has to do in many ways with the fact that we're using the properties of you know, the small uh, quantum mechanics to create a computational model that is different. And the classic way to understand this, and I'll try to motivate it uh, briefly for you, is that in regular com computing, uh, when you're building, let's say, um, I don't know how many people did computer engineering, but when you start in computer engineering, you build a adder, you know, so basically adding two numbers. Uh, and you have a bit, another bit, and you can add them, and you can build a circuit very easily to add. With that, you can keep building and build a processor, and then you can keep adding and so on. But fundamentally, your entire computing system, including these supercomputers in our pockets, are dealing with bits. So every piece of your computation, whether it's the processor or it's the instruction to the processor, the data, it's all encoded with zeros and ones, so bits. And the bits are either zeros or one. In a quantum world, we deal with this thing called a qubit. And that has direct, it corresponds directly with how uh, quantum mechanics, or at least, you know, uh, how nature works in the small, where the qubit is sort of this um, both state of zero and one at the same time. And you resolve that state by observing it. So, you know, in quantum mechanics, they tell you, Tell me what you want to observe, and I'll tell you what it is. So you observe, and then you get the response. Now, of course, that would be OK if there wasn't other parts that were more interesting to it. So you can imagine if you had um, you know, a set of qubits, and you were to build an adder, just to keep it simple, then instead of adding two numbers at a time, you'd be adding eight numbers at a time, because you, you have two states. So when you start thinking of building a computer, let's say, in a classical way, but let's say with qubits, then you have the response to two to the number of qubits, okay? So briefly, to kind of understand. Now, if it was just that, it would be uh, interesting, but you would have all, all kinds of other problems because in qubits, at least when, you know, uh, even the ones that we can build right now, they tend to be noisy. So you have issues with that. So in addition to superposition, you have issues with noise because they're not perfect. But there's also another thing that qubits have that is kind of almost crazily, um, you know, to explain, but I'll try to explain it to you. Um, so I have my colleague here, Alex, uh, who's uh, a gambler. He likes to, <laughs> to gamble a bit. So if we imagine that we both had a qubit, so I have a qubit, Alex has a qubit. Uh, obviously, if we observe it, mine could be zero, and Alex observes his, it could be one. So that's a qubit. So imagine it was a coin. So we flip a coin, look at the result, zero or one, just by observing. Imagine if I do something else to those coins, so those two qubit coins, if I entangle them, which is another property of quantum mechanics. So you can actually entangle stuff. And this is, it's going to sound weird, but it works. And people have tried this many times. Einstein himself didn't believe in it, but it's true. It actually works that way. So sorry, Professor Einstein. So if we entangle, so Alex has a coin, I have a coin, and we entangle, and we flip. I observe tail. It's guaranteed that Alex's coin will be tail as well. And if I observe t head, it would be the same. So entanglement forces qubits to be the same way. So when you look at superposition and entanglement and the fact that you can actually entangle qubits the way you want, so you can force certain results. So that's where it becomes super interesting. So in the middle piece, we show you a circuit. So this has been known for a while in terms of the theory behind it, quantum information theory where people can actually start building compute, computation engine with uh, uh, qubits with those uh, three properties that I mentioned, okay? Superposition, entanglement, 
and the fact that there's errors, but you can correct some of these errors. So over the past 30 years, there's been tons of algorithms built with quantum computers, even though we don't have quantum computers as big as necessary to run some of those algorithms. So this is the, the other important piece. So there are small ones, and IBM right now has 127 qubits that we sell. Uh, there is a small startup, I forgot where, but they announced that they had a 1,000 qubit computer, uh, quantum computer. Uh, Google has, I think, also 100 qubits. So these things are happening, and they are moving quite fast. So uh, the projection for these quantum computers to have more and more qubits is is not exponentially growing, but it's growing in a really interesting uh, pace. It's, it's definitely not linear. So why is that important? Well, that's important because there are existing algorithms that were invented 30 years ago, such as Shor's algorithm, that solve problems that classical computers would take years, millions of years to solve, such as, for instance, breaking encryption. And we'll get into how that works a little bit more, or at least a little bit more details about it, and, uh, and also why it's a threat. Okay, so that's a known algorithm that has, that was created 30 years ago at Berkeley. Um, Shore was a, a graduate student there. He gave a talk, he's now a professor at MIT, and he gave a talk recently, less than a month ago, and Apparently, some of his students found a way to even improve on his algorithm. So you can get even closer to linear uh, breaking of encryption. So why is it breaking it? We'll get into it a little bit more because I want to explain to you the quantum safe aspect. So what are people doing to deal with this? Now, the other thing I need to mention to you is that in addition to Shor's algorithms, there's a lot more algorithms that's been created since. So, for instance, there is Grover's algorithm to actually make search, you know, essentially orders of magnitude faster if you have a set of data and you need to search. So there's tons of algorithms being created daily to improve. Now, all of them assume that you're building a quantum circuit and you're executing it. So that means that you have all those qubits available. In theory, you know, you could do it, but those actual computers don't necessarily exist. There are things that people are doing also to try to solve these issues, and we can get into it a little bit more. So what's the quantum threat, right? So Shor's algorithm is definitely one, one part of it, but what is the threat? So what is, you know, encryption, I guess, the, a primer, if you may, on modern encryption? It, ha it all has to do with a very simple problem that you can, I guess, execute in one direction, but it's extremely hard in another direction. So pretty much all encryption are based on this. So there's different kinds of encryption, but the most common one that we use right now, which is RSA, um, or at least uh, asymmetric keys encryption, it's all fundamentally based on uh, a part of math, essentially uh, number theory, where uh, you can find greatest common factors of numbers. So imagine you have a very large number, and I told you, give me two numbers. When you multiply those two numbers, you'll find that first number. Turns out to be an extremely hard problem to solve. Um, no known algorithms uh, in classical computers can solve, especially when you have very large prime numbers, uh, in uh, anything but exponential uh, time. So that's why, for instance, they tell you use 124-bit keys because these are the very large number that you're starting with. And because you ha when you generate um, your uh, RSA keys, you get two, uh, two, two, two known numbers. They tell you keep one private, keep them private, but share the public one, which is the multiplication of those two numbers. It's because it's super hard for somebody with the public number to guess the first two, almost impossible. So P and Q, very hard to guess if you know the result, the resulting number. But with a quantum computer, you can actually do this extremely fast. The reason for this has to do 
and I won't get into too much detail, but if you have questions, we can try to get into it a little bit more. It has to do with the fact that when you have any number, um, you can find, essentially, you can make a guess of, let's say, a, another number and multiply it by itself, so that same number, and get to, um, you know, uh, a, a resulting um, sequence of numbers that will actually repeat themselves. Okay, so if you if you go deep into part of the math, you'll see that there is some repetition. And the magic of Shor's algorithm is the fact that he was able to use, and they invented this before the algorithm uh, Shor's uh, at Berkeley, QFT, which is essentially uh, Fourier transforms, but in quantum. So QFT meaning quantum Fourier transforms. So once you have repeating stuff, you can apply um, Fourier transform to find part of the repeating uh, sequences. So that's kind of a intuit intuition maybe to, to let you know. So what have people have been doing? So obviously we've known this problem for 30 years. It's been proven that you know, the algorithm's correct. Um, but so what have we done? So in the past, I guess, um, you know, 10 years, people have looked into um, solving these but why do we need to solve it? Why, like, why is it a threat? Because quantum computers maybe will come, you know, big enough to be able to run Shor's algorithm in, let's say, 10 years. So why should you care today? Well, you should care today because there are lots of probably uh, bad actors. I guess there is, they exist all over the world, probably in this room, um, that will harvest the data and decrypt later. So the idea is that there is a huge amount of data that have life cycle that are longer than, let's say, today. So think of, like, for instance, a human being lives maybe 80 years, depending on which country and many reasons. But your personal information, like, say, your social security number in the US, is extremely important information. So if I share that with a website, you'd hope that they would keep that data for a long time. And they would encrypt it in such a way that nobody would have access to it except for you know, a need to know. And you can imagine government has secrets that they don't want to have public for years. So this is the kind of data, and banks, for instance, have that kind of information. So it's information that you care not to share for a long period of time. But if you know that you could decrypt it in two years, then you can start harvesting all that data. So that's the key threat, okay? So what have people been doing? Um, we've looked at different part of math to create new algorithms. Uh, a lot of this has to do with something called lattice math. It's um, abstract algebra. It's actually not difficult to explain, but I'll skip that explanation just to give uh, Paul enough time. Uh, but there's a whole set of um, algorithms that have been created. And to give you a hint, um, to give you maybe a concrete thing that you can do if you're interested in this, is we at IBM, and I guess shameless plug, we created a course. This is part of my team. Uh, it's free. Um, it's not open source, but it's free in the sense that you can use it. We're trying to make it open source, so give us feedback if you want it open source. Uh, and it goes into not only give you a primer of encryption, but also these post-quantum encryption, including lattice uh, algorithms. And it's free, so I would encourage you to check it out. Um, there's also tons of uh, live examples in Python, so if you, if you like to write some codes, you can just do it live on the course itself. And we are working on a badge, so we don't have a badge yet, but we'll have a badge soon. So, the government, obviously the US, um, and I think governments across the world, they've been worried about this problem for years. And what they've done is to make a call to a proposal of different new algorithms. Um, and this is uh, part of the timeline that happened with NIST. And you can see very recently, the, we, the competition entered a final phase where the algorithms that were chosen, the four that we listed here, 
these are the, the ones that I mentioned are based on Lattice. So for all of these, there is actual implementations right now on the web. Um, I was at uh, in Washington DC last week and we were discussing some of those implementation, including some from Amazon has a few in open source uh, and so does Sandbox AQ, which came from uh, Google and obviously at IBM, we have that too and tons of other companies. So there is a bunch of different efforts going on. So this is for encrypting, but also for digital signatures. Yes. So very quickly, other things that we're doing, and Paul is going to give you uh, a live demo, but we also have a effort going on to build a foundation for code that's going to help Linux become quantum safe. A big part of that is open quantum safe that actually came from the University of Waterloo in Canada, uh, Professor Doug Stabila and his team have created, and we've contributed to this also, it's all open source, to um, help you uh, have common libraries where you can change things like SSH, TLS, and other tools. And we're trying to build a foundation, a Linux foundation to include all of this, so this is also coming. Uh, another big piece of work that we've done is CBOM, which is an extension to SBOM, that will allow you as an enterprise or an organization to understand part of your infrastructure and your deployment, where do you need to change things? And then finally, uh, let me pass it to, to Paul and we'll have some time at the end for questions. So Paul will talk about how we can, what we can do to protect Kubernetes. So, so how do we protect Kubernetes? How do we make our applications safe? And the most basic the kind of question we need to ask is where do we need to be secure? So we're running an app in Kubernetes and it's pretty simple. We've got a client, it's gonna make a request to a server. So we need to secure that connection. And we can do that today with TLS, so we just need to use quantum safe algorithms. We have those. So what does that look like? Yeah, good. Oops. There we go. So we're just gonna run a curl, connect to a server, and what we're gonna see happen here is if I put my mouse on the right screen. There we go. We looked, we have our SSL connection here using the Kyber algorithm. We use the lithium for our key signing. That's a quantum safe connection. Easy enough, right? <laughs> Except it's not quite that simple because this is not what an app running in Kubernetes looks like. There's a whole lot more parts we need to kind of talk about here a little bit. First, your client may not be correct in connecting directly to your server. Oops, helps to use the right, oops. Uh, well, even if you're, uh, sorry, uh, even if you were correcting directly, how did we build a curl that can use quantum safe? Well, first we had to build OpenSSL that could use these new algorithms. Today you can't do that in OpenSSL, it's coming. Uh, but the, uh, I think the next release it'll be there, but it's not there yet, so you have to build from source. Then you have to build LibOQS, that's the API interface to use these new algorithms. Then you build the provider. Then you build curl with a patched in way to use this new curve. And then you can make your connection. So that's a lot of work to just even a simple client server connection. And as I was saying, even a simple client server connection isn't necessarily a simple client server connection. If we're using some kind of network service, say we're using a CDN, uh, like Akamai or Cloudflare, well, that's gotta understand our quantum safe algorithms. So we've gotta make sure that that can read these algorithms. Um, our server, you know, we're not just, this is Kubernetes, it's KubeCon, right? We're not just connecting to a VM or some server out in the cloud, we're connecting to Kubernetes, which means we've got an ingress and a service and pods that have to understand all of these different pieces. And this is the era of microservices. We don't just have one service running, we've got multiple ones. So those have to be able to connect. And we wanna be really secure, so we're gonna use a service mesh like Istio. That's gotta do it. And we're not just gonna run in one cloud or one cluster, we're multi-cloud, we're hybrid cloud, we're gonna run on-prem. So that connection's gotta be secure. And you know what, maybe we want a VPN in place of it. And maybe our cluster's running in a private network, so that needs a VPN. 
And this is just stuff in motion. We got to encrypt at rest too, right? And we may not be using a database, we might be using other services, like object storage or S3, or a database as a service, or multiple services. And that's just the application. What about Kubernetes? What about the control plane? What about all the nodes that Kubernetes runs on, from the operating system to the container runtimes, all the way up that stack? And then, you know, we probably should have a secure login as well. So there's a whole lot of pieces that we have to make quantum safe. So the question is, where are we secure today? I've got a helpful little graphic here. I think there's green for where we're completely quantum safe and purple because of the weird color scheme in the templated deck um, for where we are partially quantum safe. And the answer is not much. There's been some work in some browsers to support these algorithms. Cloudflare has implemented the algorithms. There's some work a little bit in the ingresses. But in general, we still have a lot of work to do. So there's been some work done. As I mentioned, you know, Cloudflare has implemented these quantum safe algorithms. The Chrome browser has them. Uh, there's been some work to get that implemented in Go, which we need for Kubernetes. OpenSSL, OpenSSH, and some of the operating systems have started to work that in. But there's still a lot of work to do. So what are our next steps here? There's really three. The first one is we need to discover where we're using cryptography. Um, you know, I had a slide back there, which was the best I could do after about a week of looking at it, but I'm sure I missed stuff. And please tell me where we missed it, because we need to, but we need to inventory it. We need to know where we're using crypto, what crypto we're using. That's important, that's step one, that's discover. Then, as any kind of good DevSecOps people, we need to observe. We have to stay informed about what's happening. When are new vulnerabilities coming out? What are the new standards? So we need to observe. We have to pay attention. We have to know what's happening. And then last, we have to transform. We have to be able to swap out our existing crypto for quantum safe crypto. We have to be agile about it. Um, I like to use the example of like Y2K. Y2K, you know, we fixed that. That was a whole lot of work. We swapped out. We went from two digits to four for years. Um, and we're good for, you know, 10,000 years, but at a certain point, we're going to need some more digits there. Similar thing with cryptography. When the next problem comes, we can't assume there won't be a next one. We don't want to have to do all of this work all over again. So we need an agile way to be able to move across cryptography. As new vulnerabilities arise, as new threats arise, we need to be able to, you know, let's do the work once and then make it easy to do it again as opposed to having to re-go through this whole thing because as we saw, it's quite a lot we got to do. Um, so with that, um, you know, please leave feedback and I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, we have some time for questions. So. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Yes. Well, so first thing is that a lot of them you can actually use now for free to some extent. Um, so they are like IBM has, I don't know, like a dozen all over the world and you can access them. And part of the work that Paul did is quantum middleware. You can access them in a serverless way. So if you're interested in doing that for sure. But of course there are some license where, you know, if you're making money, you might have to get an agreement with IBM. Um, I think it's paid relatively cheap you know, I, I, I don't want to say the, the exact price. If you want to buy one for yourself, that's more expensive. But if you just want to use time, it's actually relatively cheap. Because at this point, everybody's encouraging, uh, you know, usage and, 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 you know, most of their usage is research, like students. So it tends to be relatively cheap. Um, but buying one for you, and there are some companies that we have that have, you know, like a, you know, a complete computer, um, quantum computer at home, uh, in their side, that's expensive. And it's also expensive to run because to keep those qubits, um, you have to keep them at a very low temperature, almost close to absolute zero. So that means you have cooling. It's, yeah, it's expensive. Um, but there are, there are startups that are doing, uh, you know, in completely different approach and uh, you don't need such uh, expensive cooling. So we'll see.
qubit. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I believe the last estimate was you need about 10,000 qubits, but it's really more whether or not the qubits are, um, are very error, uh, you know, do they have a lot, do they generate a lot of errors or are they uh, like sort of pure qubits? And um, because when, when you have these qubits that potentially have a lot of errors, then you need to do error correction, which, you know, similar to Shannon's basic uh, error correction for uh, data, so. so. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's thousands of logical qubits, which, you know, would be ones would be error corrected, but I think like the actual, like the actual number you need, including error mitigations, like in the millions. So it's yeah. quite a ways away, I mean, quite a ways, meaning it's not happening tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but it, by all assumptions, it will happen soon. But yeah, the number of qubits needed, assuming that error correction doesn't get any better, I think right now is in the millions. Um, yeah. But, you know, error correction's been getting better. We've been able to make more qubits, so those numbers are gonna meet somewhere, somewhere probably. Yeah. I think the prediction is somewhere around 2030. 2030, 2030, from, from the current pace. But then, you know, you get jumps, right, uh, in, in these. So it used to be that you needed millions of qubits and then now it's more in the thousands. So, you know, if it continues. The other thing also to mention is that there's lots of other techniques that people have done to uh, look at something called circuit spli splitting and circuit splicing. So let's say you needed a circuit that required you 100 qubits but you don't have a 100 qubit computer. You have, let's say, a 50 qubit computer. You can split that circuit into multiple circuits and then execute that on smaller quantum computers. So that's techniques that have been going on. Please. I'm not sure exactly, but I think it's in the f thousands and you need to be able to entangle them. Yes, because part of the way that um, uh, Shor's algorithm work is that you basically have a set of in qubits and you entangle them to find those repeating numbers. Once you repeat, once you, once you do this and you observe any of them, you'll have the common factor that's repeating. And then once you have that, you're basically broken encryption. And, you know, like I mentioned, uh, Shore gave a talk at MIT literally like a month ago. Uh, I think it's public, uh, MIT makes it public. And you can look in there and then they mentioned that their students were improving on it already. So uh, you can imagine, right, tons of improvements. Yeah, sure. These new algorithms, yeah. Yeah, so last week I was at, uh, in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, the deputy director somewhere at NIST came to give us a talk. And uh, yeah, they're, they have labs set up to, to try these. Obviously, like anything else, um, there could be problems. You know, you, you can't prove a negative. You can't prove that it will solve every problem. Uh, that it couldn't be broken, that it's incorrect, and so on. But these algorithms have been checked by many, many experts um, all over the world, uh, especially the lattice space algorithms. They're all based on a problem that's actually pretty straightforward called, um, I think, simple vector. Um, um, it's, it's the idea of like, uh, if, you, if, I, if I have two vectors and I build a lattice, then I can, depending on the vector I have, uh, find a point in the lattice by combination, linear combination of the vector. But if you didn't know those two vectors, then it's very, very hard to find that point guessing the vectors. And, you know, in two dimension, we are a lattice here, right? Like all the points here. So if I took a vector that came like this and there, then we can do linear combination to find these. But that's two dimension. In actual lattice encryption, we're talking about thousands of dimensions, you know, difficult to imagine, but the math is the same, right? So, so the problem is hard. It, that's the the key. So, 
Well, they're they're deploying it basically. They're testing it in the lab. Right now they're in right now. They're in, I think, public comment on the standards, and the standards are supposed to be published, as I understand, next year sometime. Yeah. Yeah. So, but they're in basically. I think the yeah. drafts are out, and it's just people are commenting on yeah. them. But and people else, are testing it. Yeah. Also, that's the key. The other thing to mention about kind of what Max said about you know is it could be broken next time again, which kind of underscores that need for crypto agility. Like we can't yes. prove that nothing in the future is ever going to break these things because that's just, yeah. we can't do that. But knowing that, you know, now, you know, it was when RSA came out in 1978, Shore, Source Agra was 1994, so there was like a 15-ish year period there where, okay, we're great, we don't have to do anything, we're fine, we can just forget about this now. But now that we have the example of this is broken, or going to be broken, we need to be able to fix it. So the next time we need to be agile, we need to have that crypto yeah. agility so that if something does come up, we've got or, an easy Or way. improvements in the algorithms. Yeah. I mean, they're gonna get better as well. So, because you have to implement the algorithms, right? So the implementation could have problems in it itself too, right? That's usually most of the issues, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, so a member of my team worked on, you know, with IBM Research to have a provider for um, OpenSSL, and that means you should be able to build a TLS to, to have it and then use uh, Kyber and start testing it today. Yeah. Next version of OpenSSL, they have a blog post that um, it's going to take me forever to get to it, but there's a blog post linked in here that, uh, if I don't go too far, um, but the, the blog post is linked there for OpenSSL basis says like the next release that's coming out, which is 32 beta. So basically version 32 of OpenSSL will have the ability to select um, a quantum safe crypto curve yeah. um, to use. Um, the other thing just I think worth mentioning is that they do recommend using hybrid algorithms. So just in case there is a problem with implementation, if you're going to implement this, you don't just you don't want to be any worse off than you were. So you still use RSA, you're still just as safe as you are today. You just added extra protection on top of that. Just worth kind of pointing that out. Maybe one last question, if you have, no? Ah, sure. Anything that's using, um, you know, that's based on, you know, factoring numbers. So any encryption based on that. Nobody asked about performance. That's an issue too. But anyway, <laughs> we can talk about it later. Because <laughs> you know, you should be worried. You're, you're gonna swap your encryption. Is it gonna make things slower? You know. But sure, no. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for coming. And we'll be here. So feel free to ping us. And uh, you know, we have a bunch of references in the slides. We're testing. Yeah. No, people are, there's actually in the, at the MITRE discussion last week, we talked about maybe doing the, I think MITRE does a flag uh, call, you know, uh, what is it called? Call for flag or? Anyways, there's a competition to, yeah, to capture the flag, sorry. And we're gonna have some, some uh, quantum safe problems you know, essentially, and then start getting people to, to test it. It's gonna take probably a year or two to start deploying it. And my dream, and I think our team's dream is to, at the same time this is happening, to have uh, repos uh, to fix parts of Kubernetes, or at least the stack, where you can start adopting it and start testing it. And then hopefully with, with agility, so if we switch to a configuration-based, system for how you decide your crypto, then uh, then you could flip a switch. So that's the goal. Yeah, and I, th I think we're, you know, happy to work with, you know, part of the reason we're here at SIG Security is to work with the SIG Security community to figure out how to get this stuff done. So yeah. at least get a prototype and then see where it gets, gets us. <laughs>